I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth and final webinar in UCI Division of Continuing Education's ninth annual GATE webinar series. Today's topic is Characteristics of Twice Exceptional Children. This session is being recorded and the archive will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through our free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording tomorrow. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI DCE. Below is a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features so you'll know how to submit questions to our featured speaker throughout the presentation. Next, I'll provide you with information about several GATE resources offered through UCI DCE, including our fully online GATE Specialized Studies program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins March 27th. I will then hand it over to Lisa Reed as she will be presenting on today's topic, Characteristics of Twice Exceptional Children. At the end of her presentation, will we have a brief Q&A session, and finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we didn't have time to address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to John from UCI Support, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Lisa regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel, and we will address it at the, at the end if we have time. So some of you will already see the chat panel on your screen. If you don't, you'll want to go ahead and look for the chat bubble icon. Press on that icon, and the chat panel will appear. Now, Lisa has prepared a really robust presentation for you all today, um, and she has several slides to get through, but feel free to submit your questions during the presentation, and again, we'll try our best to leave a few minutes at the end for Q&A. Here's a brief overview of our GATE Specialized Studies program. It is offered fully online and consists of three required courses and three elective units. Our program is taught by a team of experienced instructors and is designed for individuals new to the field as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all nine units with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed request for certificate. The courses in the program range from $375 to $500 per course, depending on the unit value. You can take individual courses without pursuing the entire program. Here's a list of the required and elective courses that make up our GATE program. The topics covered in the program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of this diverse group of students. When viewing the course schedule online, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so you will want to plan accordingly. Pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates the course fee and how long each course will last. So just as an example, you can expect learning styles, a one unit course, to cost $375 and last three weeks online, while differentiated instruction, which is a three-unit course, will cost $500 and last 10 weeks online. The nice thing about our program is that you can earn your certificate in as little as nine months, and you can choose elective topics of greatest interest to you. Here's a list of the courses that we're offering in the upcoming spring quarter. As far as required courses, differentiated instruction, and for the elective courses, learning styles, and engaging students through technology. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website, and enrollment is currently open. Students can enroll either online or by calling our student services office at the number provided. And we do encourage students to enroll in classes at least two weeks prior to the start of a course. As you may already know, UCI DCE hosts an online GATE community that is free and open to the public. Please follow the directions on this slide to become a member and you will gain access to resources, news, and events regarding GATE. You also will gain access to recordings of all of our past webinars that are available through this community. UCI DCE also provides individual courses specialized in services and the entire GATE Specialized Studies program on site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. 
We currently work with school districts who are putting cohorts of teachers through the GATE program and are receiving 10, 15, or 20% off course fees. With some, we send our university approved instructors to teach the classes on site at their district office, and with others, we provide convenient online courses. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about our cohort discounts and to discuss your district's professional development training needs. The California Association for the Gifted, commonly referred to as CAG Conference, is hosting um, its conference this year in San Diego, California. UCIDCE is proud to be a credit provider for this event. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend the CAG Conference, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and write a reflection paper. This credit will appear on an official transcript that can be used as proof of professional development or toward requirements for salary advancement. So for those of you who plan on attending the conference this year, please feel free to send me an email in advance for the official enrollment form. We are also offering a credit option for those of you who have attended all of the live webinars in this ninth annual series. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must have attended all four live webinars, totaling four hours, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and turn in a reflection paper plus lesson plan. Again, you can email me at this, the email address listed on this slide for the enrollment form and requirements. So to wrap up my portion of the presentation, hopefully you saw some courses that may have piqued your interest and we hope that you will consider adding our fully online GATE program to your credentials. This slide has my contact information as well as my directors, so please feel free to contact us with any additional questions. Today's presenter is Lisa Reed, founder of the Reed Day School, which provides an alternative to tr traditional education for twice exceptional children. She has served in many roles in the field of education, including educational therapist. We are pleased to have her logged in today to present on the topic, Characteristics of Twice Exceptional Children. So I'm going to go ahead and hand the presenter ball over to Lisa so that she can begin her presentation. Thank you, and thank you all for joining for this um, presentation today. It's an important one. It's close to my heart, and this is a very misunderstood group of uh, children. So I hope that you um, gain some insights and that you're able to share them with other educators um, and other parents, if it applies. Um, I want to start off by telling you just a little bit about my background as an educator. Um, I started out, I had a biology degree and I fell into teaching. I did my one year post baccalaureate teacher certification program and kind of whipped through that and found a job teaching at an accelerated private school. Um, a lot of the kids were gifted, several were not. Um, but what was neat about my experience is early on I was asked to participate in a teacher induction study and I had people come into my classroom and they were filming me and observing me and asking me to reflect upon my teaching. And I was highly overconfident as a teacher. Um, I, I knew how to help my, how to teach my kids to give me the responses I wanted. And they looked really good when the teachers came in were people to observe me. I would ask the kids to give me the answers and everyone knew what they were supposed to tell me. But then when they started to probe to see if the children really understood, um, what I was teaching them, they, they didn't, and I really learned how much I didn't know about how to teach children. And so I went back to school <laughs> to learn more, and, you know, part of my experience there, too, was, well, these kids are gifted, and if they're really this gifted, then they should be able to meet my high expectations, and if they can't, um, you know, it's just think or swim. And I was... Um, very intense with grading and that kind of thing. And as I got to know what actually was involved with being gifted, my my feelings about what was important changed. And um, I also, I had the opportunity to enter the classroom as a stu student teacher supervisor. And I started to see really the impact that teachers can make um, when they're effective and when they know how to understand what the kids really need and how to make curriculum relevant and um, that a lot of kids who are really, really talented were being overlooked along the way because of um, really improper preparation. So overall through that experience, the reason why I'm telling you that is because um, I feel like teacher training is essential. I, I learned a lot in my teacher training programs. I learned a lot through um, the classes I took 
and I learned mostly through supervising teachers that we all are here uh, because we care and we want to do the best by these kids. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, you know, it's, what we find out is that within these programs, we don't learn everything that we need to know. And within my teaching and this accelerated program, I, I observed that there were children who were clearly bright, um, but they were also underachieving. And a lot of these, these kids were the kids who were getting into trouble. And um, as, I, as I saw this kind of pattern exist, I also noticed that in the middle school years, they were really critical, fourth and fifth grade, where their perception of themselves as people and as learners was really shaped by, you know, am I a kid who really can't make the grade or a kid who's always getting in trouble? And the trajectory of their lives was really uh, impacted, you know. Um, so uh, within my master's, I, I got in depth about what's going on with these underachieving gifted students. And I realized that there's so much the social emotional component with these kids is just absolutely critical. Um, and that led me into the field of educational psychology where we talked about instruction and motivation and self-regulation, which is a huge issue with a lot of our gifted kids. Um, and so even with all of that under my belt, I still had challenges. And I started working for this school um, in Studio City where all the children were twice exceptional. And even at that point, I had 10 years of teaching under my belt. And every day, it felt like my first year of teaching, or first day of teaching. I would go home and want to cry because it was just so difficult. And what I was told is that with these kids, there is no textbook. There, every single one of them is so completely different that you've got to get in-depth understanding of who they are as people and what they care about. And um, you know, a lot of the time we have to give them the benefit of the doubt and understand that if they're acting out or if they're underachieving, there's a reason for it. And so, you know, within these programs, with all of the schooling, you don't see a lot of classes for understanding gifted children, much less understanding twice exceptional. Um, doctors, psychologists, therapists, um, they don't get any training in the needs of twice exceptional children. And so a lot of them are either over underlooked or excuse me, they're um, misunderstood or they're overlooked. And so we have a lot of really well-intentioned people out there, teachers who care and want to be effective and professionals who don't know what they don't know. And so um, my goal, and hopefully now will be your goal, is to educate them. Um, the thing with Twice Exceptional is that it's really difficult for people to understand that you can have talents and deficits coexist. And so neuropsychologists really understand this well because they deal with people who have brain injuries. So you can find that, you know, someone who's brilliant like Einstein gets in a car accident and a portion of their brain is not functioning as effectively as it could, but they know that the rest of it is intact. And so they're able to kind of dig in and, and realize that there are discrepancies in there. Um, but what we find is that there's a pattern in schools where we just want to put a label on something and call it good. Oh, he's dyslexic, we're going to put him in this box and here's the directions for dealing with a dyslexic kid. And not only does that not address everything that's going on with the child, it also completely makes it so that the gifted piece is ignored, um, which is really, really um, challenging for the kids. So they end up on a path where they're dismissed um, and, and we need to make a point to really dig in and, and be careful with labels because um, there, there's just so much complexity with these children that um, we do them a disservice by, by oversimplifying things. So in 1964, this gentleman, Robert Rosenthal, did an experiment and um, what he did was that he issued, he gave a test of general ability to a group of elementary age students. And he told um, a group of teachers that one of the, that gr their group was the high IQ group. And he told the other group that the, his group, their group was the low IQ group. And so um, they took the test and they were pre pre prepared for the test. And at the end, um, they found out that um, the kids were picked at random. and but the impact of the way that the teachers interacted with the children actually influenced their um, progress on the exam. So the way that we perceive the kids, the point of this is that the way that we perceive the kids actually impacts how they will progress in our classes. 
Um, so this is called the Pygmalion effect. And so if we believe that all children have the ability to do well, they very likely will, and all children want to do well. There is no eight-year-old child who wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be really difficult in my class, and I want to not do well in my assignment, and I want to get in trouble. Um, so if something's going wrong with going on with kids that's making them difficult, it's our job to really dig in and find out what that is. Um, so here's an example of 10-year-old Jack, who I met five years ago. And Jack was, um, early on in his life, he had a rap sheet. He got kicked out of preschool. Um, he had changed schools three separate times before we met him at the age of 10. He was, um, he was actually defiant and oppositional and lazy. He was naughty and he was hilarious, actually, a great sense of humor. And he had um, anxiety and impulse control issues. And alongside that, he understood electricity to the point where he could talk with an electrician and he could stump the electrician. Um, he could create, and he still does create, Jacob's ladders and Tesla coils. And, you know, given an IQ test, it indicated that he's gifted. And he's gifted with also um, ADHD and Asperger's, um, what we used to call Asperger's, and generalized anxiety disorder. And so this kid has this immense, these immense talents, but he's got some other things that are really getting in his way. And he's really difficult. So we're seeing with him that he doesn't want to do any work. Um, this is an example of his handwriting. And, we're, and a lot of times you'll see with gifted children that they do have horrendous handwriting. And um, so he, everything was a big deal. You know, you ask him to write his paper, name on a paper and he'll explode and leave the classroom. Um, he's bugging his, cl his classmates. And when we re try to redirect him, he just ignores us. Um, but it, when we talked to him about things that he was interested in, and I had the good fortune of being a science teacher at the time, he really was just a totally different kid. And we saw these glimpses of just this amazing potential for him. And so we dug in and we, we worked with him in, as a strength-based approach. Um, he, even though he was little, he really could, he knew more than most of his teachers and a lot of people who were really experts even in the areas that he was interested in. So he had to be with teachers who were fluent in content knowledge. Um, he had to be with people who understood the social emotional aspects of giftedness. And he had to people, be with people who cared and were enthusiastic in spite of the fact that he was pretty difficult. Um, we also needed to let him set his own pace because some things were really, really hard for him and other things were really easy for him. And so we had to help him um, work through, through those things in an appropriate way. Um, we also let him choose the way that he wanted to approach his assignments. If he wanted to make a poster or if he wanted to write a paper or make some other kind of project that was more relevant and meaningful for him. Um, and he would come up with ideas that just seemed ridiculous, but you know, we let him explore them and we let him fail. And we also let him explore them and prove us wrong. And so um, overall, what was most important was that we respected this kid. And we told him and we showed him that we cared about what he had to offer and that we believed in him and that we would never give up on him. And as a result, over time, this child who really seemed illiterate and really seemed like just kind of riffraff was preparing work like this. Um, I don't know if you can briefly kind of take a look at some of the vocabulary that he's using in there, but really incredible stuff. Um, this is an example of a scoreboard that he made. He completely uh, programmed it, and it's actually functional to where it'll show different numbers. Um, and if you have an opportunity to, to explore something, the Pestalozzi method, that's actually the method that Einstein responded to. Um, but they talk about this where the experience is just so positive and you've probably heard of flow to where he just got so engaged and he started to see that he could actually have success. And so over time his confidence has grown. Um, he's starting to be able to do more non-preferred things. Um, he's starting to persevere and his behavior is improving and he's, he's giving a little. Um, he's also has, starting to have some social relationships in a, in a successful way. Um, because he knows he can. Um, so again, the point of this is that children want to do well. And if they're not doing well, it's our job to find out what's, what's getting in the way for them. Um, 
So looking at what it means to be gifted, we have the normal curve, and you can see the lighter shade of gray. That's where we would call kind of our typical kids. Um, you know, down on the, the left side, you have the percentage of kids, that 15%, um, that we would call intellectually disabled. Um, we have all kinds of services, and we really, you know, everyone goes really far out of their way to support this group of pro students, and rightly so. Um, we understand that they experience the world in a very different way and that they need very special kinds of supports. But what we don't really remember is that on the other side of the curve, that 15% there is just as far away from the normal. And so, um, but when we think about this gifted group, we don't, people don't typically think about them as a group of kids who is experiencing the world in a totally different way. And in fact, they are. Um, the farther that you get up the giftedness scale, in fact, um, when you get into exceptionally gifted and profoundly gifted, these are kids who socially, emotionally, physiologically are just having a totally different experience. And so they need just as much support as kids on the other end of that curve. So these are some example learning profiles. And um, we joke about this a little bit. but in our program, we'll, we'll get profiles like this gifted sweet spot profile you see on the left, where everything's kind of, you know, right around the same range. This is a gifted kid. This is a kid that likely is going to show up to school and is going to be able to follow directions, um, sit in his chair, get his work done or her work done, and, um, you know, is the high achiever that wants to produce for you a lot of the time. On the other side, we have the, again, the highly gifted or profoundly gifted child who um, is really exceptionally bright. You can see with the um, profoundly gifted child, the verbal comprehension of 148 and a processing speed of 119. For those of you who don't know, 130 is what we typically call gifted. And when you have um, kids who have this discrepancy, even though processing speed a processing speed of 100 would be normal, and um, a processing speed of 119 is great. When you have a 30-point discrepancy between what you're able to take into your mind and how able, how able you are to process that, it causes them a lot of anxiety. Um, and so that, and this is a pattern that we see a lot is, is this discrepancy between their processing and verbal. Um, so our group in the middle that we're here talking about today is the um, twice exceptional child. And so you can see verbal comprehension is really high. Perceptual reasoning is very high. This is a child who can solve puzzles um, very well. Working memory can remember things very quickly. Processing speed, very low, um, relatively no, low. This is it's actually a typical processing speed, but relative to his strengths, it's quite low. Um, this can be because of a handwriting challenge. This can be because this is a kid who it just takes him a little while to express his ideas. So the kids who are raising their hand and shouting out in class are going to totally overshadow this really bright kid. Um, so on to the next slide. A lot of the challenges that kids can face, um, because these kids are so bright, they are able to compensate for them. And because they're compensating, they're working twice as hard as a lot of the other kids that are in the class. And so um, all of these that we'll, we'll run through can be things that are kind of hidden, that are holding kids back, and that are causing behaviors that um, are misunderstood. Um, the misdiagnosis of ADD and ADHD is rampant with our group of um, with twice exceptional kids because of their misbehaviors, because they are intense kids by nature. Um, we're going to get into Dabrowski a little bit later, but um, visual processing disorder, auditory, sensory, all of these things can cause things that look like AD or ADD or ADHD. And so I highly recommend that families go through and they rule out all of these things first and then go to the ADHD. Um, diagnosis or thought, um, if pediatricians are really quick to just jump to that, it, it concerns me. 
So language processing, this is something that gets in the way for kids. Um, obviously, dyslexia, we, you can have children who can read at grade level, but they're st they still have dyslexia. So um, we call that stealth dyslexia because they're able to hide it. We also have kids who are able to pick up on context clues as they're looking, reading through a story, or they can even memorize parts of stories. And so a lot of our twice exceptional kids don't even get, no one even realizes that they're dyslexic until they're in fourth grade because they are so able to hide it, especially, you know, in some of these um, situations where they could be overlooked if there are a lot of other students in the class and whatnot. Um, but they also have trouble understanding language, so if, if a teacher is giving directions or um, if there, there are typical cues that would tell a children that you're supposed to do something next, they're not picking up on these things. Um, this is the same with auditory processing disorder. This is one of the biggest things that we see as well. Um, this is not diagnosed by a hearing test, so a child can go in and have a hearing test and it can come out perfectly. This is what the child does with the information, what their child's brain does with the information once they've heard it. Um, <clears throat> if they are hearing everything, um, it, I've heard it like Dr. Webb talks about it, it's like going to a cocktail party when you're at school. So you're trying to listen to your teacher, but you can hear the car driving by, the bee that's on the flower that's outside the window, the buzzing of the fluorescent lights. When they're taking in all of that input and also trying to listen, it can be really exhausting. And so a lot of these kids will start melting down at one o'clock in the afternoon because they're just completely overwhelmed from a sensory perspective. They also may have um, auditory delays or um, if you think about if you have been on a cell phone call and it's cutting in and out, that's how the, some of the kids are actually taking in some of the information. And so teachers will give the kids directions and the kids won't actually get all of the information. And then if they're not following directions, this is a smart kid who obviously should be able to just do what you ask them to do. Um, but it's frustrating for teachers because they don't get why they haven't done what they've asked them to do. And it's because the kids actually haven't gotten the information. Um, with visual processing, again, this is not going to be diagnosed. It's not a regular vision screening. So you can have perfect vision but still have a visual processing disorder. In order to determine this, you have to go to a developmental optometrist. Um, visual processing challenges are not the same thing as dyslexia, um, but they can have some similarities um, where kids, they have visual discrimination challenges. Um, they may have difficulty if they're, you're writing something on the board. They might not be able to get the information from the board to their paper by the time the information they're supposed to be writing it down, they've forgotten it. Um, they also may have, a lot of times we'll give kids sheets, like you'll see on the left there with the division problem. There's so much information on the sheet and if kids have visual discrimination challenges, um, it can be visual overwhelm to where they can't keep it straight. So you want to not have so much information on the page for the kids. You really need to chunk it, maybe two or three problems in any given white space and give it to them in smaller segments. Um, memory has a lot to do. You can have kids who will remember things that you'll tell them, but they won't remember things that they read and vice versa. Um, this also can look a lot like ADHD because with executive functioning, if kids have challenges with working memory, then you might say, can you please go clean your room or go do your homework? And by the time they get to their room, they've forgotten what you've asked them to do. And you think that they're just ignoring you when in fact they can't remember. Or multi-step directions, um, please brush your teeth and then go to bed. They may do the first part and they'll forget the second. Um, for classroom teachers, these kids, if you give them a two-part question, these are the kids who will answer the first part of the question and not the second. Um, so all of these impact the executive functioning for the kids, um, their ability to plan ahead, to be, behave accordingly, um, to organize their thoughts, 
um, for essays, et cetera. Um, motor dysfunction and, or output dysfunction, as I, I've heard it um, called by Mel Levine, um, with these kids and their processing speeds. So like we were talking about before with the discrepancy, if you have a very high verbal comprehension and you have all this information in your mind and it's moving very quickly and you <clears throat> are supposed to write it, it, your hand can't keep up with how quickly your mind is moving. And so you'll see it actually can be like physically uncomfortable for kids to write. That's why we see a lot of sloppy work. And that can cause a lot of frustration for kids. It also makes it so that their ideas that are so perfect and great in their mind are not looking the way they wanted them to on paper. And so these kids actually can turn into non-starters. Um, they're all, a lot of time called, you know, working below their ability um, and that kind of thing because it looks like they're just giving you, you know, they'll give you a one sentence answer um, when you know that they have all this information in their mind that they could share with you. So with these kids, I highly, highly recommend accommodative technology. Uh, voice to text is a great one. If you can get kids typing as early as possible, then that is helpful as well. Um, so perfectionism with all gifted kids is a real challenge and it's something that um, is very important to address for kids. Um, kids that are gifted, everything comes really, really easy to them. Um, life is grand and it's fun and then we hit third or fourth grade where we're moving from really concrete concepts into things that are abstract and um, that involve a little bit more work and the minute after I've been called gifted and everything's gone so well and all of a sudden I can't do something, they don't understand what that is. And um, their perseverance, their ability to kind of work through things that are hard for them, it hasn't been developed and so it can turn into a panic. Um, they, they, you say, I want you to draw a dog and they, they won't know which dog to draw. You have to tell them very specifically. Um, and so it can be really, uh, you have to break things into chunks for these kids to help them to realize that they can be successful again a lot of times. Um, <clears throat> we use the word gifted a lot with kids and it becomes almost their identity when we're talking to them and I catch myself all the time saying, oh, you're so smart, oh, he's so gifted. And so when the kids think that that's all there is to them, um, and then all of a sudden something goes wrong, it can be really devastating. And so when we talk to our kids, we really want to talk about, wow, you're a really wonderful person. Wow, I love how you worked so hard on that. Um, I love how creative that was. Um, and, oops, excuse me. So um, with this variability in learning profiles, we talked about how learning and sensory challenges can be masked because of the kid's ability to compensate um, anxiety that these kids live with. And now I just want to get into the overexcitabilities or also, they're also called intensities that these kids can have. Um, so there's psychomotor, sensual, imaginational, intellectual, and emotional. Um, a lot of these kids, even really little kids, can deal with existential depression. Um, and then also, also, you know, of course, being gifted has a lot of positive things to it. So um, we want to help them to be able to access the positive things. Um, gifted research and outreach, um, GROW is doing a lot of research now, which is fantastic. And they're looking at, um, some of it is looking at the brain. And they're seeing that actually physiologically, children who are gifted um, have different brains. And there's more white matter in the brain. Um, they also have a larger part of their brain that processes more emotional information. Um, and so we see with kids who have high IQ that there's often a higher tendency for depression and anxiety. This is not just because they're deep thinkers, although that's a big part of it, but also because they are physical, they're wired for this. Um, they're also taking in the world in a more intense way with the way that things touch the feel to them, the way that it smells, hearing, vision, and all of that. 
Um, so with this processing speed that I keep coming back to, it's really interesting because we know that bright kids who have a fast processing speed, you know, they think so quickly and they're doing this and they're doing that. But then there's also, they're seeing that with these white matter tracks and this really fast processing speed that it's almost like they can have a traffic jam. And so, again, with a lot of our gifted kids, they can be non-producers. They can, we see dysgraphia a lot, um, which is challenges with physically writing um, the information. They can draw beautiful pictures but can't um, think through responses to assignments and physically write them at the same time. Um, and so it's just something to really think about when kids, when your gifted kids are not producing, there can be a physiological reason for why that's going on. Um, so with twice exceptional kids, again, this um, white matter research that they're getting into, we really need to remember that there are intellectual deficits that can happen with all of these sensory, learning disabilities, all of it. Um, but while we're thinking about that, we also need to remember that for ki these kids, it's critical that we address the giftedness as well, because that can get lost in the mix. So <laughs> the social emotional needs for these kids, um, as they mature, and the reason why we have, our, our organization started out with very first graders um, is because as kids mature, they're, they're, things become increasingly difficult and they become farther and farther behind and also more and more frustrated with themselves. And so behaviors can become ingrained. Um, and so we want to help them early on to understand themselves as um, really unique individuals that need special attention to um, some self-regulation pieces and um, you know, how hard they are on themselves as well. So with our psychomotor kids who they just talk and talk and talk or they are very impulsive, they act out, um, they might be compulsive organizers um, or very competitive. Our sensory kids who um, the tags on their shirts beg them or the classroom noise really gets to them. Some of these kids um, actually, if they get bumped into, it can feel like someone's really hurt them. And so even if someone's playing around with them, they might feel like they've been punched. And so it will cause an overblown response to something that is just normal playground fun. Um, so that's another reason why some of these kids can be misunderstood. Our intellectual kids, um, this overexcitability, I think, is the piece that we normally think of when we think of gifted. Um, and then the imaginational mixing fact and fantasy and drawing and writing. Um, so with the psychomotor overexcitability, this again, this is the hard one because with intensities and giftedness, it's hard to know sometimes if it's ADHD or if it's really just um, giftedness. And so I am not a psychologist. Um, I always need to preface, preface this with that. But I do like to tell families that if the overexcitability is getting in a child's way and if they're not able to enjoy their own life or achieve the goals they've set out to achieve as a result of it, then it's something to be um, addressed and talk to a doctor about. Um, with central excitability, the, the bright light um, that we have in classrooms, they, these are kids who might overeat. Um, they, as they get older, they may go on buying sprees. Um, they, um, these are our daydreamers, our imaginational. Um, they like for inventions and drama. Um, and then again, our intellectual that we've talked about. Um, so our emotional overexcitability these are kids who just, they go from zero to 10 in an instant. Um, they can actually have, they get very stressed out and they can have physical responses so they, their stomach can hurt sometimes. You can see them blushing a lot. They get deeply attached to people, places and things. Relationships with kids can be hard because um, they may think in advance of what could, what could happen if they actually lose that friend. Um, and so they'll 
really cling on to them or actually they will avoid friendships because they're afraid of getting hurt. Um, these are kids who are highly, highly empathetic, who they'll be in a classroom and they won't be able to focus on what they're supposed to be doing because they're so concerned that, about another person in the class that is feeling sad or how their feelings hurt. Um, and they also, you know, these are kids who can be talking about concerns about death, um, meaninglessness. They're very, very concerned with the right and wrong and what is fair. Um, and they, you know, because of all of this can just really have a difficult time socially and they can feel like they're kind of out of place. Um, and so these are these are kids we really need to support emotionally. Um, so with this again existential depression that can happen with these kids, um, they it just have a tendency to really overthink. They can be uh, idealistic and they start to see the world early on. You know, I have this teacher who I really look up to, and then I find out that the teacher doesn't know as much as I do about something, and this is something that's really important with kids is to, is to help them understand that we're all human early on. Because if, if we don't make mistakes in front of the kids, um, they find out early on that it's a trust issue. So we need to feel safe in making mistakes with them. We need to um, say, I don't know when we, I don't, when we don't know and we explore things together. Um, and you know, that avoids a lot of this disappointment that can happen for kids throughout their lives. Um, an interesting thing to know is with this impulsivity is that so 80% of highly gifted individuals are unemployed and underemployed. Um, we also find that a lot of people with really high IQ scores tend to max out their credit cards, miss payments, and go bankrupt um, more than those with people who have lower I score as in, you know, some of this is because of maybe idealism to where the gifted children or gifted adults are really wanting, they see the way things could be, and so they're going to do everything they can to make it perfect and make it be like that. Um, it also can be an impulse control issue. Um, and what's important to know about all this is that when we're wanting to prepare kids to be successful in the future, we need to realize that employers are going to be looking more at their emotional intelligence than they are going to be looking at their intellectual ability. And so it's essential that we work on this social emotional component early on. Um, so in thinking about how to provide support for these kids, the very first thing that I suggest people do um, is to really get an in-depth understanding of what is going on. Um, <clears throat> typically in Typically, the baseline reports that you will get from schools don't give you all of the information that you need. Um, they won't be able to tell you generally, um, you know, if there is a processing disorder. And so I highly recommend that families go and they get a full neuropsych evaluation. If, they, if something's not right, if you just have a sense that something's not right, um, go to a private place for, for a full neuropsych. And um, <clears throat> with anxiety, you want to help understand kids that help the kids understand that um, it's okay to feel anxious. That all people feel anxious at some time, sometimes. And you know, we have kids who are terrified of tsunamis, or they don't want to get in an elevator, um, and they ruminate on it, or they'll fixate on it. And you know, understand that even though the, the fears that they are expressing to you sound ridiculous or irrational, they are very, very real to these kids. And so if they if they start to understand what it feels like to have fear, to um, you know, understand that they can overcome these fears um, and use tools that we use make your warrior a warrior. There's another book, What to Do When You Worry Too Much. Um, to help them to develop a plan to overcome different things that they're having fears about then um, that's going to help them to gain confidence. Um, <clears throat> with the psychomotor challenges, if you can help a child to understand, uh, with, we have a lot of kids who just talk and talk and talk and talk, and so if you 
can demonstrate to a child, A, what it looks like and how it feels to be on the other end of that, and then also coach them through what a normal conversation should look like with, you know, hearing what someone else has to say, responding to what they said to demonstrate that you've listened, that kind of thing. Also creating structure and um, routines, making sure that you have a sleep routine is critical. Um, technology is just a huge challenge, I think, for everyone these days. Uh, but if you can at least make sure that children are not using technology two hours before bedtime, it actually changes your sleep cycle <clears throat> if you're using technology close to the time that you're going to go to bed. Um, also with healthy eating habits um, and realize that if a child is overstimulated, that sometimes that can be as a result of what's going on in the environment. So if you have an environment where things are kind of hectic, if there's stuff all over the walls, if there's music going on, that can cause kids to feel overstimulated. So you want to create a calming environment for them in order to support them. <clears throat> so there was a story about a man who just loved going to the beach with his children. And so every Sunday he would get them all ready. He would pack up the car with all the chairs and the umbrellas and the buckets and the shovels and all of that. And they would go to the beach. And then they would get to the beach and he would just sit down and he'd start to set everything up. And the kids would be completely out of control. And within 20 minutes they would be back in the car and everyone's crying and he would go home. And he kept trying this. And one day he went. And he starts unpacking, and he looks over, and he sees that there's a man with his family, and what he's done is he's dug this giant hole. And he, the kids are acting, they're there, and they're playing, and everything's just so peaceful, and he's thinking about what's going on with this. And the difference was that the kids had a boundary. They knew where they were supposed to be. And because of that, there was calm. And because of that, they, they were able to actually enjoy their day. So uh, we want to give children who are gifted freedom of thought and action, but in fact, we have to do it in a way that provides structure and routine. Because without structure and routine, it's a very, they are not sure if they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, and um, they need guidance. And so they'll, they'll feel very anxious if they don't have that. Um, within classes, you want to allow for movement breaks, we use a lot of things like balance boards, standing desks, um, balance chairs. You can use non-distracting fidgets. You can build in mindfulness into your classes. And then um, occup occupational therapy is another excellent way to support these kids. With our imaginal, imaginational kids, um, something to say, there's a lot of research right now going, up at, going on up at Stanford about how the brain functions and when people, you know, come up with their best ideas. And I'm sure you've heard people say, oh, um, you know, I can't, you've thought of your best ideas in the shower. Um, we have the kids just going from one thing to the next or they've got their technology and, and everything is just so fast paced and we don't allow for them to be bored. And um, what we need to do is embrace the idea of giving them free time, giving them slacking off strategically. And we need to let them be uncomfortable with being bored as well. I think a lot of times we'll watch kids and they'll say that they're bored or they don't know what to do. And we want to entertain them, but we need to force ourselves to just pause and let them figure it out. Um, and then again, when you're teaching the kids, if you can integrate it, choice in the way that they demonstrate um, what they've learned, then that really gets them excited about what they're learning. Um, we want to, so in dealing with underachievement also, a lot of our kids can arrive to school and they can learn the entire curriculum within the first month for the entire year. And so what they're doing is they're showing up to school and they're just trying to do whatever they need to do for you or whoever else to tell them that they're OK. And they're doing whatever they're doing to, as a means to avoid um, embarrassment or, or to avoid failure instead of doing something for the sake 
of intrinsic interest or for the sake of improving upon oneself. And that's, that's a, not a good pattern that we want the kids to fall into. Um, we, it's the curriculum, a lot of times, the way it's presented is, is culturally insensitive. And so we aren't presenting information that is of interest or relevant or meaningful to, for the kids. And so because of that, they'll opt out. They won't be interested in learning. And our kids are so smart that what they can do um, is actually they can turn school into a game where, like the kids did for me in my early classroom, they can give me my rote responses and fill out my worksheets and do all these things and get an A and actually learn nothing. Um, and so their, their ability to just kind of work the system is actually more exciting than the information itself. And so what we want to do is actually get them emotionally and actively involved in their learning. Um, we want to help them to, we want to give them explicit expectations about what we're wanting them to do. Um, we also want to help support them to, uh, so they can see the successes that they're having along the way. Um, we need to make sure that they understand that they are actually part of the classroom community. Um, if you have kids join together and create classroom norms together instead of having an authoritarian approach to gifted children, um, that's going to make a big difference. Letting them know that they have a voice um, and again giving them choice will make a big difference for them. Um, if you have an organized environment for the kids, it's going to actually promote respect and it's going to de decrease anxiety from the children. And also, again, any kind of author authoritarian approach with these kids is generally going to bring a power struggle for you that is going to make life pretty difficult. And so if you can partner with them in their learning, if you can show them that you um, respect them and that you want them to fall in love with learning and, and create a learning environment that tailors to their interests, then they're going to work much harder for you. And again, um, show them that you make mistakes and that you're human. Um, with these performance goals, um, we want, it's, we've seen that kids with performance goals, actually they become more concerned with competing with their peers and out, out do, shining their peers than they actually are with learning the information. Um, and when they're learning like this, the information that they learn is superficial. It doesn't stick. And so they don't deeply process it, and it's not going to be a meaningful, meaningful information. And so thinking about grading and our weight on points and what it means to have done a good job in classrooms is something to think about. Um, Dr. Robert Brooks, if you have a chance to look at his work, is excellent. And he says, um, 10,000 children were asked what was the most important thing to them, and they responded, good grades. And when we look around and we see, you know, bumper stickers that say, my child is an honor student, we never really see a lot of emphasis on, you know, my child is caring or my child made a difference in the world. Um, and this is something that we really need to think about because with our kids with this existential depression, with these, the tendency toward anxiety, um, the most important thing that we can do for them is to help them find a sense of purpose. And so early on, if we can show them how to care about others, um, how to think about others, this is something that leads to resilience in our kids and is going to help them go through some of these most difficult times. Um, so I'm going to skip this. Um, with, within classrooms, helping children with explicit feedback I already mentioned, when you're giving feedback on information, on something that they've turned into you, if your feedback not, is not just a score, but is actually a response to what they did, I really liked the way you wrote this. Um, I'm asking you to give me a little bit more because I know you're capable of giving, giving me more. When you provide feedback like that, it actually is positively impactful and the kids will work harder for you. This is research, what research shows. Um, also, if we can, in the classroom, reconsider the emphasis on handwriting. Early on, I know there's a lot of research that shows that for, from a brain development perspective, handwriting is important. But when kids are in a classroom, if it's impeding their ability to, 
share with you what they've learned, then we need to give them an alternative way to express their knowledge. Um, this is just a quick study to share. Uh, this was a birthday study where we, they had a bunch of people go in um, and they, they were told that they were going to take a, a math puzzle. They were supposed to figure out a math puzzle. And one group read some information about these researchers, um, and they were role models in the math field and, and all of that before they took, did the puzzle. And then the second group read the same work about these researchers, and on, on that work, they actually saw that their birth date was the same birth date as their own. And that little piece of information that made them relate to the researchers that prepared this study actually impacted their performance to the extent that they did, they worked 65% longer on the puzzles than the people who went in and had no kind of attachment or sense of belonging to what was going on in there. So little things that we can do to help the kids to feel connected is going to help them to um, feel more motiv motivated to work. Um, this emotional, again, the connection is just so important and understanding where they're coming from, the lens that they're um, using to perceive what's happening in the world. Our focus um, should be on the principles and values um, rather than the people. And um, just understand that, you know, behaviors that we're seeing twice exceptional kids and with gifted kids overall, a lot of times they're just trying to protect themselves from being hurt. Um, if we can help them to understand. Sharing human interest stories is wonderful for kids. Um, giving them opportunities to be with their true peers, the other gifted children, other twice exceptional children is going to help them a lot. Um, and then also with a lot of this intense feeling that they have, if we can use this, this empathy um, to help them to make a difference in the world. So moving from um, they can actually shape this as, as part of their purpose rather than having it be something that weighs them down. Um, Love and Logic, I, I really like the way that they, that this system works with kids who are having behavior challenges. Um, one of the main things is if kids are highly emotional, um, do not allow yourself to become emotional with them. And when they're regulated, when they're calm, is that you work with the kids to problem solve together. Um, helping children that understand that it's okay to have strong emotions is important. Um, something that is helpful for a lot, of, a lot of these kids is to have a gratitude list, um, to think about what's going well in their life and to think about their successes, um, things that, that they're looking forward to. Um, so the critical pieces of this, this is actually a very high-risk population. My biggest concern for these, this twice exceptional group is if you group, you know, these intensities, some overlooked or masked learning disabilities, um, and then, you know, some challenges that they've had early on, if they're labeled as a bad kid or if they're labeled as an underachieving kid, that stays with them for life and they can often, um, you're going to shift to something that's going to make yourself feel better. And so whether that's a, a negative social interaction or, you know, some kind of self-soothing situation um, with bad choices in middle and high school, we don't want that. And so early on, we want to help the kids to develop self-awareness and self-advocacy um, and for parents uh, finding support groups in order to deal with this challenging group of children is, is very helpful. Um, we want to help people, again, to understand that our kids, these gifted kids, are just as far from the norm as the kids that we work so hard to support on the other end. Um, and we, again, need to train more professionals. We also need to encourage the government to start providing more support for our twice exceptional kids. In working with parents, um, if you are a teacher working with parents, realize that parents are coming from a place of heartbreak and misunderstanding. And a lot of them, you know, people have thought that they actually are, it's because of poor parenting, and it is absolutely not poor parenting. And so you need to be able to team with them to listen and um, discuss plans of action instead of talking about things that have happened in the past. 
Um, this is a movie about twice exceptional children. Um, I highly recommend it. And just essentially, we want all of, all kids to do well. And if they're not doing well, something's getting in the way. They're not inherently lazy or defiant. Um, I encourage people to move away from labels and pathology and to focus on the strengths of these children and use their strengths to remediate their challenges. Uh, there's a lot more of these kids that, that meet the eye. And um, if you believe in them, that's going to go a long way. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to contact me. And that is the end of a very full presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. And yes, it was definitely a full presentation. And for all of you who are logged in, um, unfortunately, we don't have, we ran up to that hour uh, time mark, so we don't have time for Q&A. However, uh, Lisa was kind enough to leave her contact information here. Um, I'll also switch over real quick. Um, if you have any other questions, you can also email me. My email address is on this slide. And a recording of the webinar will be sent out tomorrow. So if any of you logged in, I know there was a lot of information on those slides, so you will be able to rewatch it at any time. You can pause, jot down any notes. Um, so please keep an eye out for that recording link that will be emailed out to all of you tomorrow. Let me go back one more time to Lisa's contact information so that any of you who are logged in can jot it down if you have any follow-up questions regarding the content of this presentation. And Lisa, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to share your knowledge with us on the characteristics of twice exceptional students. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you who are logged in today for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed the entire webinar series. If you missed any of the webinars earlier this month, or if you would like to re-watch the series at any time, the recordings will be uploaded to our online gate community. So feel free to send me an email if you want to become a member. And again, we are offering a credit option for this webinar series. So if you have attended all four of the, the webinars, um, please do reach out to me and I can send you more information about the credit option requirements as well as the official enrollment form. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I, <laughs> is it just you and me on the line?